It's almost ready. It's Ben Nuttall. He will uh, talk um, about his open source Python project, tools for maintaining an open source Python project, a walkthrough of some great tools I use for developing, testing, maintaining, and managing projects. I see he's online, so please share your screen. And let's go. Okay, let me get this full screen. Okay, can you see my slides okay? Perfect. Right, okay, well, thanks for that. Uh, so, yeah, I'm gonna be speaking about tools for maintaining an open source Python project. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a software engineer at the BBC. I work in a, an innovation team called BBC News Labs. Um, I joined there in January from, uh, from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So I was, I was there the last six years. So if you've seen me speak before, uh, I was probably advocating Raspberry Pi. Um, I created the GPIO Zero library and the Pi Wheels project, and also uh, one of the contributors towards uh, the Pi Jokes project. I write for opensource.com and uh, you can find me on Twitter and that's my GitHub. Uh, this is what I um, used to look like in real life, and now I kind of look more like this, as you can see, um, lockdown, lack of haircut. And this is what I uh, look like online, this, this, uh, this is my avatar. Uh, so just to give you um, a brief over what this uh, talk covers, uh, I'm going to be talking about how to organize a Python module and how to structure uh, the files. Uh, how, to, uh, how people distribute software and different, um, different methods of doing that, and why we do it. Uh, using Git and GitHub uh, to version control and publish your and share and collaborate with your so, uh, your software with other people. I'm going to be touching on virtual environments, um, testing and uh, testing your software and automating your testing, uh, documentation, documenting your your code and your project, and a little bit on uh, licensing your software. What this talk is not. So this is not going to be a thorough follow along tutorial uh, because I mentioned about 50, you know, 50 different tools uh, and I'm just gonna be mentioning them mostly in passing. Um, you're not gonna be able to um, follow along and, and kind of do examples and things as I go along. I'm just gonna kind of quickly brief over them and, um, and you know, kind of give you the, the big picture. If you wanna learn more about each of them, uh, I'll tell you where you can, you can find out more. I'm also not going to be telling you which tools you should be using or which tools to use. Um, it's not my job to be telling you which, which tools um, you should be using. Uh, I'm just sharing the ones that I use. And if I've not mentioned another tool, it's either because I've not come across it or the, the examples I want to share are with the, the tool I've chosen. Um, everyone has uh, the right to choose whatever tools they want to use. Uh, I'm also not telling you that uh, in order to be a proper considered a proper Python programmer, you need to know about all of these tools and need to know them inside out. Um, uh, so I hope, um, hope that, doesn't, that, that comes through. So just to give you a background, what uh, a lot of the uh, contents of this talk, uh, where they've come from. So uh, the GPI Zero library I mentioned, uh, I developed this uh, when I was working at Raspberry Pi. It's a Python library providing a simple API for physical, physical computing with Raspberry Pi. Uh, it eases the learning curve for young people, beginners, and other educators. Uh, it's a nice Pythonic API if you're an advanced programmer, if you're an experienced programmer. It's, um, it's not just um, a kind of a, an easier way to do things for kids. It's also quite a nice, nice way to do things once you know good Pythonic, uh, to write, be, able, be able to write nice Pythonic code with your GPIO and your physical computing with Raspberry Pi. And you find the, the docs and the, the GitHub project there. Um, I just wanted to share that um, Kido uh, started playing around with a Pi um, uh, last year and he tweeted saying it, uh, about yeah, how he loved the library. So I'm a bit of a humble brag there. Quite pleased with that. Uh, Pi Wheels, uh, my, my other project. So um, this is uh, the tooling for automating building wheels uh, of everything on PyPy. So wheels are uh, binary distributions of compiled, compiled Python libraries, uh, modules. Um, PyWheels.org is the repository um, that, that's, that's built on, uh, that's built from the tooling. So it's a whole repository like PyPy.org. Uh, it's a PIP compatible repository that hosts ARM wheels that have been built by the tooling uh, that is PyWheels. We uh, natively compile ARM wheels built on Raspberry Pi 3 hardware targeting Raspberry Pi users. And 
it's it's a, the repository is hosted on a single Raspberry Pi in a in a, in a cloud platform, and uh, it's and that single Pi serves over a million downloads of Wheels per, uh, every month, and that's at piwheels.org and the source is on GitHub. So with the, these two projects, uh, I work with a friend of mine called Dave Jones. Uh, he's a professional pro programmer and amateur dentist. Uh, this is a pic recent picture of him um, before he performed some <laughs> dentistry on, on, his, uh, on his partner over, um, over the lockdown period. Um, and I'm using this photo with permission. Uh, he's, uh, Dave is responsible for implementing my crazy ideas. So with things like GPO Zero and Pi Wheels, what generally happens is I come up with something and say, oh, this would be, be good if we could do this. And um, he ends up um, implementing it. What the way we tend to work is I write the first 90% and then he goes on and writes the next 90%. Um, and um, yeah, Dave, so Dave's co-author GPO Zero and Pi Wheels with me. And he's also got a bunch of other really, really cool projects that, he, uh, that he's built himself as well. Um, and Dave introduced me to a lot of the tools that I'm that I'm using in this talk, so I wanted to give him a hat tip for that. So uh, when we start writing a Python module, it usually looks something like this. You just have a file, a Python file, um, named after your project, whatever your project is. You write your code in there. And that's how, generally speaking, that's how projects start. So you start with that. Um, now you might uh, want to throw that up onto GitHub. So you can use, um, you can create a repository and push your, your code up to uh, a personal GitHub repository. So for instance, under your own name. So this is, this is my username on GitHub and this, this is a project that belongs to my own uh, user account. Um, so you push it up and the way, the way GitHub uh, works is uh, at a very base level is that it, it's like providing, a, so this is a folder containing a single file. And if I create a Git repository of that and push it to GitHub, uh, it will essentially put the folder structure of, um, of my project online in a really, really basic way. And obviously it does much more. Um, you can also uh, use, create a GitHub organization for your, for your project. So especially if you have a, a project which comprises multiple components, multiple different repositories, you could have different repositories under a particular organization name. So this might be a company, it might be a, an open source project, it might be a wider group or something like that. So GPI zero, for instance, um, you can actually move uh, things from a personal account to, a, to being uh, under an organization. Uh, so I did that with both of these projects, GPI zero and Pi Wheels have their own organizations and the multiple repositories belong uh, in, in each uh, organization. Uh, so GitHub uh, provides a way to add collaborators to your project. So you can in invite individual GitHub members, GitHub users, um, or you can create a team and say, these people have access to these repositories or these people have read access it's, if it's a private repository, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and with an organiza organization, obviously you, you invite them to the organization and they, they, and they have whatever access that you've given them. So get, get, uh, has branches and so with github when you when you push up multiple branches of code you could be working on one feature that's not quite ready to be merged yet and you could be working on it and share it um, uh, online on github and other people can see it uh, but also you know other people could be working on other on other uh, parts of the project on different branches and they could be managed that way and with github you get uh, a visual representation of what's going on there um, so uh, you, with with GitHub releases, so uh, if you tag a a Git commit with a with a with a release uh, name, then you can um, you can share them like this, and you can see the different points at which uh, versions have been released. GitHub provides uh, issues, uh, which are, are a really good way of um, both you accepting bug uh, bug reports from your users, and also for yourself to as the as a maintainer to kind of drive the development of your project and your roadmap. Actually, well, I, the way I tend to do things is, I, if I want to see a feature in my library that I'm going to implement, I create an issue saying, it would be nice if we had this, or it, you know, it would be good if we, if we did this, and describe it in whatever detail, and either I get around to doing it, uh, or somebody else might be able to pick it up in the future and, and do it themselves. Commit the code and close the issue. And you can tag, lab, tag, tag issues with labels and, and organize them in different ways. Pull requests, this is a way for, once your code is on GitHub and accessible to others, other people could take a clone of your project and commit, commit some code, push it, and request that you merge their changes in. So a lot of people are able to contribute to some of these libraries 
because it's out there on GitHub and they can uh, they can contribute and you have the you know you have the ability to uh, modify or uh, reject or merge changes as as appropriate. And uh, GitHub also provides project boards, uh, which are either way a way of you organizing your existing issues and pull requests, uh, however you want. Uh, but also you can create uh, sort of little notes, which are just just uh, not not issues, but just little bits of text that say, you know, things describing your project and, and features that you want to add or things that you need to address, um, and be able to visualize the kind of state of state of play, um, especially if you're collaborating online. Uh, and not you know office based having visual representations of something you might have post it notes for in in an office um, are really can be really useful for for managing the project um so distributing software so um how do we do this so it's quite common for for software to be uh, packaged uh, in such a way that it can be installed by many users and for instance on linux um you might expect to be able to install some software with, app, with the apt tool, uh, so apt install, such and such, or uh, Fedora, RPM, and Yum on, on other systems. Um, and then you've got things like pip, which is a language-specific pack package manager. So pip is Python's uh, package manager. NPM is for Node.js, and gem for Ruby. Uh, then there's things like Linux Portable, so snap, flatpak, app image, and different, different methods of distribution have pros and cons. Uh, and they're quite popular at the moment. And then on Mac, um, you've got Homebrew, so you can brew install something. Um, and then there's sort of lesser, um, uh, lesser sort of quality access to, to software, things like just downloading it from um, lots of less sophisticated ways. So downloading from GitHub directly or, or you know, I've talked about GitHub a lot and I should mention Git, GitLab and there are other alternatives available that provide a lot of the same, the same sort of functionality. Um, downloading from SourceForge um, in the olden days, uh, or providing something uh, accessible for download on your personal website, and uh, and things like curl as well, um, that uh, are different methods of distributing your software. And uh, so, why do we distribute software? So, first of all, for for ease of access. So, uh, you kind of you if you make some software and you want other people to be able to use it, they need to be able to download and install it. So if you can do that in a uniform way that, that matches their expectations, then uh, it'll be much easier for them to, to use it. Uh, if, if, I'm on, uh, if I'm using Linux or uh, you know, De Debian or Ubuntu, I sort of expect that you know, if, 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 software, if, if, uh, if software is available, it, that it's available in apt for me, so I can apt install it and I kind of expect that it's just there. Um, or, or if it's a Python library or something, I, I might expect that it, I should be able to pip install this. Uh, not have to go and find the website where it, it, it's hosted on or or the obscure method of downloading it that um, uh, that they provided um, and with um, especially with apt and, and things like that that you you have uh, a certain amount of trust and confidence that you're what you're getting is good quality and that it's that it's the real deal it's from the from the uh, the author themselves and that you're getting it from an official source and um, that the, for the stability so you know that you know, this is coming from the right source and it's, um, it might be, a, especially in something like Debian, you know that this is, the stable, this is a stable version that's supported in Debian. Um, and if it's, uh, if it's on PIP, you might um, be, you know, you can, you can actually go there and look and see, these are all the version numbers, these are the, the release dates, what version am I on, and you kind of know where you, you, know where you stand, which is really important. Um, so licensing is good, important to talk about at this point. So it's really important to, for you to choose a, a license for your project. Um, now it's really easy to just discard this and say, well, you know, it's just open source. If it's on GitHub, then people can do what, what they want with it. But actually what people don't consider is, well, if this happened, would that annoy me? Or would I be annoyed by somebody's use of my, of my project? If they started selling it, would that, would I, would I think, well, that's not fair. Um, if they started using it a particular way, if they, renamed your project if google took your project and renamed it and released it as you know under their own branding would you be happy about that or would you rather choose a license that protects you in whatever you want to be protected so there's lots to think about it's not a simple issue i'm not going to recommend any particular license if you go to chooseolicense.com that's a great resource there for um describing what it is that your your project needs and uh, what your needs are and it will help you choose a license that's appropriate 
Uh, it's also important to say that um, it's important to include the license with the source code. So include it in your GitHub project, include it in your files. And when you make uh, a distribution that you, that you share, if you're publishing it to, um, uh, to PyPy and it's pip installable, that the license should follow the code wherever it goes. So when somebody installs it, the license should be with the code there. It shouldn't be left to, you know, this came from PyPy and the license is on the GitHub page and that kind of thing. So it's important to keep it with the, with the project. So if you, just, if you want to start creating a, a Python module, regardless of which method of distribution you're going to use, um, essentially you want to start with this. So you've got your uh, project.py that we had before. So that's where your sort of implementation of your project lives. If you stick that in a, in a folder or a directory called, um, that there's the name of your project, uh, and you need to create an init.py with double, double underscores on you know, each side. So this is the, the name for this is dunder init, which means double underscore. So you stick an init.py in your project folder, have your project, project, um, project code in, in another file, and you have a readme file. Now I'm gonna be talking about different formats for, um, for readmes and, and documentation later, but uh, this is a restructured text file. Um, and you have a setup.py. So the setup.py uh, might look something like this. This is a reasonably minimal um, setup.py. So this describes how your, your project is built and how um, it's, how it's um, which, which modules it provides and, and things like that. So it's using uh, the setup tools module. Uh, so we've essentially runs on this setup function provided by setup tools. So setup and you provide it all the different information about your project. So you give it a project name, uh, a version number, well, it doesn't, not strictly a number, it's a string, but uh, uh, you can look up about how, pe how people tend to version their, uh, their software. Uh, you give it an author name, uh, a short description, just a, a one-line string, uh, a license, um, you can provide keywords, uh, a URL to where people can find, find the project. If you've got a homepage or if it's just on GitHub, you can put it there. Now packages, um, I'm using the find packages uh, function here provided by setup tools. All that essentially does in this case, because it's a really simple example, is that that will return the string or a list, I think, the, uh, of the string project, which is the, the name of the folder, which is this bit is what is, becomes importable or becomes distributed on uh, the system when somebody installs it. Um, but find packages will go away and find any, any modules that are available provided by your, your package. And then a long description is what will be shown, uh, you'll see later on, on a PyPy page, the kind of full, the full description of what, uh, what the project is, which is usually, usually your readme um, in the GitHub project. And it's good to be able to replicate that both on GitHub and on PyPy. And uh, I'm just using a, a read function there to open it from a file. Uh, so if you want to publish your Python module on PyPy, uh, that's the Python package index. So first of all, you register an account on pypy.org. You uh, create a, uh, a PyPy RC file with your uh, credentials that you, you created, so your username and password. And you want to install a tool called Twine. Um, and if you, if you look up um, the, on the, the Python packaging documentation, uh, it didn't used to be um, as good as it was, but it's got a lot better recently. Uh, so there's some really good documentation there you can find out on how to go through this full process, but that's uh, the gist of it. And once you've published your uh, module, you can see that it's, it can be available as a PyPy project page, something like this. So this is the, uh, the one line, uh, the short description. This is the full description, which I haven't really made much use of. Um, and the, the different rele version releases uh, and the files that are available and a link to your homepage and all that kind of thing uh, becomes available on, on PyPy. So um, init.py, um, uh, there are different choices that you can make about how you structure this. So, I mean, it's possible to just write your full implementation of your project inside <coughs> init.py. Uh, but people don't, don't, don't tend to do that. The two kind of schools of thought that I use um, are, uh, so this is one of them with GPI zero, we want to make it really easy for, uh, it's just a library, so people just import things from it. So we want to be able to make it easy for them to import it and not worry about uh, a nested structure of different, where different things happen to be implemented in different files and different folders. So we want to be able to provide um, from GPI zero import LED or button or servo motor, that kind of thing. 
we just want them to be able to import all the bits that they need at the top level namespace. Um, and so in init.py, uh, we kind of use relative imports to bring in everything that we need, that it, whether they're scattered around in different files and different, different locations. We import that and provide it in init.py, which means people can import it easily. And then the setup.py contains things like um, the version number, and that goes straight into setup, and that it isn't being imported from here. With a, with, a, um, with a library like this, where you've got code in your init.py, it's, it's tempting to try and put your version number and things like that in, in your init.py so that people can import it and see the version, but it, it can cause uh, conflicts if you, if, you, if you structure it like that. Um, if you're providing imports and things, because when you run setup.py, it tries to import your code, which might have dependencies, and then you might start Im importing things, uh, and that might cause you problems if, for instance, your dependencies uh, aren't available at the time that somebody's trying to build the project. Uh, and so the, the alternative way of, of doing it, if you're not actually trying to provide, if imports and the import structure isn't the most important thing, um, if your thing is that if your if your package is a um, is a module that people install and they get access to command line tools, for instance, rather than a library that of things that they import, um, this is a, a good way of doing it. So actually putting all your um, version number and all your setup.py metadata inside init.py, and then um, and then importing it from your module and passing them into setup. Uh, and another thing is uh, entry points. So entry points are a way of providing access to um, parts of your program that you want to make available as console, what we call console scripts. So if you want to make a command line tool uh, where the, the word, the, the command project, for instance, um, launches some, some part of your program, your, of your project, um, you would do it like this. So you provide uh, entry points in the setup function. You define entry points as a dictionary uh, console scripts are one of the types of, of entry points. Uh, there are others. And then that's got a list of um, each command that you want to provide. So project, uh, it's a bit odd that it, the syntax is like this, uh, that it's all just in one string and that the, the dot here and the colon are kind of syntax, syntax within a string, but this is, um, this is just how it is. So this uh, essentially makes the word project available as a, as a command. Um, uh, and it finds the main function in the CLI file in your project called project. And for, uh, once it's installed, you'll be able to do something like this. Uh, so virtual environments, um, a really uh, good way of isolate, creating an isolated environment that you pip install your requirements into in your, in your package. Uh, you can actually build your project inside the virtual environment and in such a way that the changes you make in your library are sort of installed in real time. So if you make changes, you can. It's as if you've got the latest version of your 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 project installed in the in the environment, uh, and you know that it's separated from your wider environments. It's not got your system Python. It's um, it doesn't have the system packages that are installed, um, and it's just isolated from everything else. Um, I recommend a tool called uh, Virtual env Wrapper, which provides this this command uh, make virtual mk virtual env, um, and with this command you you create a, a virtual environment called project. And as soon as you've run it, you'll see the word project in brackets below you in, in front of your, um, in your shell. Uh, and then in, if you're on Linux, for instance, you might be used to using Python 3 as your, uh, as your Python, because that's the system Python. But once you've created a virtual environment, you can tell it to use Python 3, but then Python and pip become the, they point at your Python and your virtual environment, and your pip. So you can see here I've got which Python and it's put it inside environments project bin Python. Uh, use the deactivate command to, to close the virtual environment. And then if you want to switch to another project, you can use work on. So the first time you do it, you don't need to do that, but uh, because it creates it for you. Um, but if you want to revisit one, just use work on and the project name. Make files. So this is a bit, uh, this is a thing I imagine a lot of people are a little bit, um, uh, not skeptical of, sort of uh, almost afraid of. Um, they, they seem like quite a complicated archaic tool, but um, if you strip them down to their basics, they can be really useful um, and quite, actually quite simple. So for instance, I, I, everything I've showed you so far, um, I would, you know, you need to be able to be able to provide a way of people installing from 
the source code, so pip install dot, and you just provide uh, the command make install, which wraps around whatever your install instructions are. And uh, make develop would, in this case, install it in an editable way um, so that people can, um, people can develop on, on the project in, a, in their virtual environment. And just, you know, you start small with something like this, and later once you've got, you know, things like test suites and documentation builders and deployments and all, that other, all those other things, you can define inside here how each of them should be and then provide them in a really uniform way. So make install, make develop, make test, make deploy, whatever it is that you've got. And you can just, you know, there's a lot more complex things you can do and lots more you can learn, but um, I think they're a really good way um, to get started. And like, like all of the things I'm going to be talking about, the best way to learn more is to take a look at other people's projects and see what they do. Uh, so testing next. So um, the whole point of testing is uh, the idea that you write tests to validate what your code is supposed to do. Uh, you keep your old tests around to make sure nothing breaks in future. And if other people are working on it, they don't need to know about those tests. They just need to run them, uh, run the test suite. And if they introduce a bug of some code that you know you wrote a year ago, five years ago, uh, the test suite will tell them about it. Um, so there's a, an approach called test driven development, TDD. Um, so for maximum effect, uh, if you're taking that approach, uh, you write the tests before you write the code. So you kind of write by wishful thinking and say, well, I think the library should do this. And you write how the user would, you, would write it. And you say, well, I assert that um, this would happen when they run this function. And then you see it fail and then you go and write the code that actually makes it pass. And then you know you kind of drive yourself forward in that way, which is uh, a, a, an interesting and, and useful approach. Um, so uh, you can you know you can write tests that run really quickly, um, and it's important that they do run fast because then you you're not held held up by waiting for your test to run. Uh, and it can be automated. So once you push, it can run uh, on something like Travis, which I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, automatically, so that you can. Um, uh, so you can just see instantly on, for instance, if you know somebody else writes some code, sends you a pull request, you can see did the test pass or did they add any new tests, that kind of thing. Uh, so important to to be pragmatic when you're when you're writing tests. Test edge cases don't exhaustively test every single possible combination of inputs. Um, it will run slowly and it's not an effective way of of testing. Uh, but it is it is difficult. It is an art form. Um, writing writing good tests is is, uh, is a complex task, and you know like like all these things, it's a learning curve. So having tests is better than not. Um, but uh, having too many tests or having exhaustive tests is, is not that useful. So the easiest way I think to get started with testing is uh, not using any testing libraries, not installing anything, just using a built-in keyword, assert. Uh, so if, for instance, your project defines a function add, which takes numbers and adds them, you can just import that function and assert that add two comma two equals four. Uh, and if this, if this didn't return four, it would uh, fail and there would be an assertion error. So uh, just a standard um, Python exception. And, uh, but if it passes, it just carries on. So they're really, really useful way of just really quickly um, testing things. Um, a good way to structure it uh, is to put them in functions like this. So have test add and, and then had, you know, have multiple tests in here. Uh, and with PyTest, if you, um, uh, which is a really cool um, testing library, but it can, at its most basic level, can be a really nice runner for your for your standard tests, your assert tests. Uh, but if you name your functions like this and name your files like this, so you have a test folder, and you name your files test underscore something, and have your functions named test underscore something, it will run them. And so you can see my structure looks something like this. Um, I've got test add, and that contains uh, a test called test add. And you can see that when I ran that, it passed. So it's just a bog standard simple uh, example, but you can imagine for much bigger projects, you'll have reams and reams of, of uh, tests passing and, and, um, and seeing when, when anything fails, when you've broken anything. Um, PyTest also gives you some additional features. Um, the, the, the main one I, I use is um, testing assertion, uh, sorry, testing exceptions. So if you, it's quite difficult just for using a cert, well, it's impossible using a cert on its own to assert that then an, ex an exception got raised because that will blow up your program. Um, so the way you do it is 
you import PyTest and you say with PyTest.raises some error and you, and you uh, use the context manager and put your, um, the code that's, that you're expecting to raise the error inside. Now, if it doesn't raise the error, then the assertion fails. So that's a, a good way of, of testing that as well. Uh, Mock is a really good library as well. So this is um, since Python 3. Point something, this has been in the standard library and in, in the unit test module. Um, so this is a really simple example of using Mock in your test. So you can create a Mock object that, uh, in this case, contains a, a method called message uh, that, re that just has the return value of, of hello. So you're kind of mocking up a, 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 an object that has, a, um, has an attribute that's a function that uh, has a method that, that has some predetermined uh, return value. And so you can see there, I've got my mock object and that's the wrapper. And when I, when I call m.message, I get the, the string hello back. Um, and another thing that mock comes with is something called patch, which is a good way to um, patch some functionality that's not in your library, but perhaps your library relies on. So something like this, this is from the GPR zero tests. We have uh, a, 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 an interface for dealing with the time of day. So it's a, a time of day object is active between the times that you set and it's inactive outside of those times. So you could wire this up to say uh, an LED and say, well, this LED should be active at when this time of day uh, object is active. So the LED is on during between the hours of 7 and 8 a.m. Uh, much the same as a button could, could be connected to an LED and you could press the button and that is what controls the LED. But this is uh, a time construct uh, rather than a physical button. Um, and so with that, I'm obviously using date time underneath. And so I have to patch the instance of date time within my library and say, well, I'm going to test it. I'm going to say, well, the um, when they call date time, the first time, um, I want it to return this particular date. So at 6.59, I should assert that the time of day is not active because it's not seven yet. And then I should be able to tell it the next time you call date time, return this. Uh, and it's now 7 a.m. And now the assertion is, should, be, should be true. And then at 8 a.m., it should still be true. And at 8.01, uh, it should have gone back to being inactive. So it's just, just all I'm doing is patching date time. I'm still actually testing the library, still doing an effective test, but it's the thing underneath that I can't control rather than have to subtract and say, well, take the current time and add a minute and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's a much simpler way of doing it. Tox is a really cool tool for, um, for running your tests in multiple Python versions. Um, so if you're on Ubuntu, you can, if you look up something called the Dead Snakes uh, PPA, you can apt install multiple Python versions, not just the one that comes with your distribution of Ubuntu. Um, and all it takes is a tox configuration file that describes which uh, Python versions you want to run your tests in, and you have to have them installed, or, or otherwise it will just give warnings saying couldn't find this Python. Um, so that's a really good way of just on your machine, be able to run the tests in multiple Python versions. There's a lot of times when, you know, if, you're, if you still support an older version of Python and you're using a new new bit of functionality like, an, like F strings or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's passing on your machine because you're running Python 3.7 or 3.8. Um, but then you see Tox, you know, tells you, oh, this one failed because I don't know what this, uh, this F string thing is. Um, so it's good to be able to do that. Coverage.py is a really, uh, another really cool tool that um, uh, does coverage analysis of your, of your programs. So based on your test suite, uh, it checks whether uh, checks which parts of your code, which lines of code have been touched by your tests and which ones haven't. And if you've got something like a tree, like a, you know, an if or a for or a, a try except or something, and it's going, there's multiple different ways that it could go, it will identify which, which branches of those trees didn't, didn't get touched. So it could, it, it could even be something like, uh, you know, it always goes into the if and never goes to the else or, you know, something like that. Um, and it just shows you like, actually you are not testing this part of functionality, uh, which is a good way of, um, of finding, you know, getting, getting good coverage of your, of your, of your tests. Um, it's not completely foolproof because it's really easy to just obey the thing and, and fill in all the gaps, you know, and sort of hack your way through it. But, you know, again, it's an art, lots to learn, but uh, it's, it's a good indication. So coverage for GPS zero, for instance, gives you something like this. So these are all the different files. 
and it shows you which lines are missing from the tests. And you know, if something's at ninety-eight percent or something, perhaps you're not that bothered. But if something's a lot lower, uh, you might want to go and investigate. Well, actually, we're not testing large parts of this of this file. Uh, so Travis CI, uh, CI is uh, continuous integration. So this is uh, an online service which is free to use if your project is open source, and uh, you can you can run you can define uh, which Python versions to run. But as soon as you uh, push to GitHub, or if there's a branch or, or a pull request, it will run all your tests um, on on the Travis servers and give you a, a report saying you know it passed on all these versions or it failed on 3.5 or whatever, uh, which is really useful. And it also feeds back to your, um, as does uh, code coverage, they feed back to your, um, to your GitHub. If it's a pull request, for instance, it'll feed, uh, post an issue, uh, sorry, post a, uh, a comment on the pull request saying, uh, yeah, all the tests passed, but um, the, uh, the code coverage went down by one point something percent, that kind of thing, which can be really useful. Um, both for you as the maintainer and for any contributors that that uh, did the um, uh, that the uh, file the PR. Uh, so again, just revisiting make files example here uh, because you know the tests are it's it's sort of a non-trivial. It's not just a case of you type pytest and hit enter. It's because I'm using coverage aligned with pytest and I'm using a particular configuration file. Defining that in here just makes it much easier for, for people because they just know I run make test and if that changes in future if, if the um, If I'm if I'm adding another library that I'm using underneath or changing it somehow or the pytest command changes um, You know, it's it's still there make test still works. You just update the uh, the, the de definition uh, So again for stuff like this, it's really really useful to have simple make test for that kind of thing Documentation. So um, um, there are kind of, according to Daniel A um, of Divio, who's a, a friend of the Python community um, and previous chair of the PyCon UK conference and society, uh, he does a brilliant blog post on this, which you can you can read up on uh, the Divio website. There are four types of documentation. He says uh, there's tutorials, there are how-to guides explanation and reference. So reference is one quite common one. You'll find people document their APIs. So they'll say, this is a function that has this. This is a method that works like this. This takes this, these parameters, that kind of thing. Um, but they'll also kind of bundle in things like backstory and, oh, you know, this is an in-joke and, you know, oh, this is, this is how you install it. And if you're on a Mac, then you do this. And it kind of bloats and becomes really messy. So he, his, Whole proposal is that we should be splitting these into into those four things. But he gives a brilliant talk uh, about uh, that whole concept, which is really and really worth uh, reading about it on their, their website as well. But yeah, documentation is really useful. So um, again, looking at really easy ways to get started with these things, and, and looking at more uh, advanced routes as well. So a really easy to way is it, uh, to document stuff is just put README files uh, in your GitHub repository. So write them in, um, in Markdown. And um, if people, if somebody's looking at your project, even if it's not published onto PyPy or it's not a Debian package or whatever, um, just being able to come across it on GitHub, you can read uh, on the README. Um, so this is just a couple of examples um, of what README, uh, what Mark Markdown documentation looks like on GitHub. And so Markdown looks like this. So um, it's really simple syntax, really, really, really simple syntax um, for for writing stuff. So you've got a hash here, which is which is a title. Two hashes is a header. Just text on its own is just a paragraph. Uh, use hyphens or or asterisks to to make a list. And a link looks like this. You put the square brackets around the text and round brackets around the, the link itself. Um, there's also a project called MK Docs, which is um, a Markdown, Markdown based documentation builder and it exports static HTML full websites of your Markdown documentation. Easy to write, it's easy to deploy and you can self host it or put it on GitHub pages or something like that. There's uh, lots you can do with it. Restructured text, uh, I find a much, much more um, stringent sort of markup language, um, quite complex, quite, um, quite, a, lot, quite a, a, a learning curve, but you know, in essence, this is uh, similar to, to what, I, what I showed previously. So you've got a title, it's a bit more verbose, you've got a bit more stuff ahead of two list, uh, list items. Uh, but this thing is something that's a little bit different. So 
this is a, a link that's pointing to another documentation page. So with another page within the project, and you can do things like that. They're a little bit more clever, a little bit more sophisticated. And it will actually get the, um, the, the page title because it has context of what all the other pages are. And it will um, include uh, the page title and a link that way. Um, so there's a project called Sphinx, which uses restructured text. Um, you can, uh, what's really clever about it is you can e it extracts the docs from your doc strings. So if you write doc strings anyway, you've kind of already written your documentation and it will build you a site out of your doc strings. You have the power to kind of choose which pages and where, where things go, for instance. Uh, you can also link to, um, link to the Python documentation. So if you link to a Python function or a Python class from the standard library, uh, you can also link to other, um, uh, other Sphinx projects. Um, uh, if you, if you, you know, perhaps your dependent libraries. So Sphinx, for instance, something like this, you can write, um, you can write a, uh, a page and say, well, I want to have this paragraph and this title. Um, and then for each class, and you just say auto class and you tell it which, which um, parameters to provide and uh, which, which methods and things to provide. And it will, automatically grab them from your documentation and fill them out like this. Uh, the Py you might have, uh, be familiar with Sphinx because the Python documentation and a lot of uh, projects in the, okay. uh, a lot of uh, projects in the Python ecosystem are, are use Sphinx. Um, uh, read the docs is quite a common um, method of deployment for those. You can have multiple branches, uh, multiple versions and, and access um, whole, whole projects that way. Uh, really easy to automate. As soon as you do a release, it um, auto automates a new build of, of your documentation on every branch or every uh, new release. And um, GraphViz is uh, something I use in my documentation as well. Really cool way of creating little graphs to describe parts of your project. Um, I won't go over this, but uh, this is just a way of describing the relationship between two boxes and that kind of thing. Uh, and you can do more complex things like class hierarchy diagrams, which are automated from your Python code, which can be really cool. So we've got a load of stuff in our project now. Um, so just to, to summarize what we, what we discussed, so uh, how to organize your Python module, the module structure, uh, distributing software, PyPy and PIP, using GitHub and all the different um, tools that it provides, virtual environments, testing and automated testing, uh, documentation and uh, software licensing. Uh, I, I tend to um, write about tools like this that I come across. Uh, I've got a tooling blog at tooling.bennuttle.com. It's by my, by my friend Les, who does, does something similar. And uh, I kind of post on there uh, every now and then. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, you, you know, new tools that I come across, do, do follow that. Um, and that's all from me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We already have questions here. We are a little bit late, but we have enough time for two questions. The first one is you mentioned the, for Linux, those packages, pip, etc., and also for Mac. What about Windows packaging options with Python? Uh, so pip uh, is, is, is compatible with Windows. Um, so you you know a lot of, uh, for for most thing most projects you'd be able to use pip exactly the same on Windows. Um, I don't know a lot about um, Windows um, packaging beyond um, beyond that, uh, but there are people out there in the ecosystem making making I know that make, making it work, and there are some really good Python community members that that work at Microsoft and working on those kind of things. So. Um, I don't have any particular expertise uh, to, to be able to answer that, but I, I know that there are there are options. Yeah. And Python itself, I know, is in the Windows 10 store now, so I know it's it's easy to get Python and uh, and it comes with pip. So yeah, you can use pip, um, but uh, there isn't uh, necessarily the equivalent of something like apt for for Windows, and not in quite in the same way. I think there's there's something going on at the moment, but um, not quite a complete picture of the the open source uh, uh, ecosystem the way there is on on say Debian okay there is another question and also unfortunately the last question for this session what are your thoughts using github actions instead of Travis CI uh, I haven't used it yet uh, it looks really interesting I've been meaning to, to take a look yeah definitely worth looking at 
I think uh, there are some people um, I've seen in the Python ecosystem using it and seen some good things about it. OK, thank you very much again. Thank you. And if you want to ask more questions, please go to the Discord channel. You can reach that by pressing Control or Command K and then typing maintaining and then you see the first first uh, uh, result search result is the channel for the talk and i see there's also already some action there so please continue there thank you very much